and Ishmael devotees, welcome to day 39 of our Bhakti Vai Bhava seminar on Srimad Bhagavatam Canto 4. We are in the 18th chapter of the uh, fourth canto. 18th chapter is titled Pritu Maharaj Milks the Earth Planet. Let us, let us chant our prayers. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharne Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastyatyadish Tarne Sri Krishna Chaitanya Pramanityananda Sri Advaita Gadadha Shivasadi Gora Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare <coughs> Hare Rama Hare Rama Ra Rama Rama Hare Hare Vajkalpa Trubias Cha Kripa Sindubya Eva Cha Padiyadanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Right Yes, so we are, let's see, we're going to continue on from verse 14 and we're in a section, the third section <coughs> Uh, which is the sections from 13 to 27 and we call the section Others make calves and milk the earth. Right, so okay here we go, verse 14. All the great sages transform Brihaspati into a calf and making the senses into a pot, they milked all kinds of Vedic knowledge to purify words, mind, and hearing. Mm -hmm. So they milked these things out of Mother Earth. Vedic knowledge they milked out of Mother Earth. So Brihaspati, of course, Brihaspati is well known. He's the, the priest of the demigods, priest of the heavenly planets. Sometimes he's described as being <clears throat> the spiritual master of the demigods. And Vedic knowledge was received by the great sages through him for the benefit of humanity throughout the universe. In other words, Vedic knowledge is one of the necessities for humanity. And if humanity remains satisfied simply by taking gra grains from the earth and, and other material necessities, well, society will not be sufficiently prosperous or happy or stable like that because it's not just a matter of eating or, or other material necessities. So humanity must have food for, for the mind and the heart. This is very... And for the ear, like the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, in Kali Yuga, if this Vedic Maha Mantra is chanted regularly and heard regularly, by the devotional process of Shravanam Kirtanam, which is mentioned, of course, in Bhagavatam 7, 5, 23, as is stated in the purport. So it will purify all societies, and thus humanity will be happy, both materially and spiritually. Verse 15. All the demigods made Indra, the king of heaven, in, into a calf. Phew. And from the earth they milked the beverage Soma. It's a type of nectar for the demigods. 
And thus they became very powerful in, in mental speculation and bodily and sen sensual strength. So soma rasa, it's a type of nectar, type of beverage they make in their heavenly planets. And as the verse suggests, it makes the demigods more powerful mentally and increases their sensual power, power and bodily strength. They're in the, in the verse in the third line of Sanskrit, <coughs> the words Haranmayena Patrena are there. You may remember those words that occur also in the Ishapanishad. <coughs> and, excuse me, <coughs> those words indicate that Soma is not just some ordinary intoxication like some liquor, whiskey or wine or, you know, what I mean. Demigods would not touch any sort of that sort of rubbish. But it's also not a drag. It's, you know, it's very, it's a different kind of beverage. It's a heaven, heavenly beverage. And it's far different from the liquors of the demons. As the next verse will make clear, Prabhupada says. So verse 16. The sons of Diti and the demons transformed, transformed Prahlad Maharaj, who was born in an Asura family, a demon family, that's a fact, although he's a great devotee. So they transformed him into a calf <coughs> and they extracted various kinds of liquor and beer, which they put into a pot made of iron. So as demigods have their drinks like Soma Rasa, it's just a, a very high level type of beverage. The demons too do also rubbish drinks like beer, wine. Yeah. So the, the demons born from DT, they love these drinks even today. And, you know, Prahlad, of course, Prahlad's very, very famous as a great, great devotee. But he was born in a family of demons. And Prabhupada says here in the purple, by his mercy, the demons were and still are today uh, able to have their drinks in the form of wine and beer. So an interesting little point is that the, 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 uh, the container for, the, for their wine and beer is made of iron. Aya is, means iron. And of course, you know, iron is very low class. The soma was put in a gold pot. <laughs> so it gives some idea of the relative values. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, <clears throat> because the liquor and beer are inferior, they're placed in an iron pot. And because Soma Rasa is superior, it is placed in a golden pot. Verse 17. The inhabitants of Gandhava Loka and Apsara Loka made Vishravasu into a calf and they drew the milk into a lotus flower pot. The milk took the shape of sweet musical art and beauty. Well, Gandhavas and Apsaras are like that. They're, they're lower level heavenly personalities. Uh, we just read what, maybe last week, or not long ago at all, that Gandhavas and Apsaras are kind of between demigods and humans. Yeah, but it's a fact that often they're counted as being uh, demigods. Verse 18. The fortunate inhabitants of Pitriloka, who preside over the funeral ceremonies, made Aryama into a calf. With great faith, they milked Kavya, which is food offered to the ancestors, 
into an unbaked earthen pot. Ar Arima is a, a high-level person like, like he's a demigod basically. He's an assistant of Yamaraj. Yamaraj, yes. And indeed when Yamaraj came as Vidura, then Aryama stood in and, and, and was performing all the functions of Yamaraj until uh, Yamaraj returned. Prabhupada says, oh, <laughs> Prabhupada says, he is somewhat of a demigod. Yeah, he's somewhat of a demigod. Okay. Um, yeah, predominating deity of Pitriloka. So anyway, Prabhupada notes at the beginning of the purport in Bhagavad Gita 925, it said, Pitrinyanti Patrivrata, those who are very interested in family wel welfare are called Pitrivrata. Yeah, so if you satisfy him, Prabhupada says, he can help ghostly family members develop gross bodies because people who are really sinful, very attached to family, country and whatever like that. They may not get gross bodies. They remain in subtle bodies. And in other words, as ghosts, which is not nice because ghosts have mind, intelligence and ego and they have desires oh, to enjoy material life, but they don't have gross bodies for sense gratification. Therefore, they're disturbed. So the family members have to offer oblations, do some types of yajyas to Aryama or Lord Vishnu. And Prabhupada says then that uh, the son, the son of a dead man goes to Gaya and offers oblations at the Vishnu temple there to deliver ghostly fathers. Of course, not everyone's father becomes a ghost, but if he has, then the offering to the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu will, will save him and give him a, a proper gross body, which, I mean, you know, it's not that exciting, is it? <laughs> we, we have our gross bodies. <sighs> not again, please. We really would like a spiritual body. Prabhupada makes a very important point. If one is regularly taking prasadam, there's no chance of becoming a ghost or anything lower than human. And if all goes well, if you're practicing and chanting nicely, practicing Krishna consciousness, then, then you'll... Uh, you'll go back to Godhead. But at least if you offer oblations to Lord Vishnu or Aryama, your forefathers will get gross bodies to enjoy whatever material enjoyment they want. So there you go, Hari Bol. Verse 19. Verse 19. After this, <coughs> the inhabitants of Siddhaloka as well as the inhabitants of Vidyadra Loka, transformed the great sage, great sage Kapila into a calf and making the whole sky into a pot. They milked out specific yogic mystic, mystic powers, beginning with anima. Indeed, the inhabitants of Vidyadra Loka acquired the art of flying in the sky from this whole program here. So Prabhupada explains these people have naturally have mystical powers to fly in outer space and even between planets. So just as fish can swim, swim in water, the people of Vidyadra Loka can swim in the ocean of air. And the people of Siddha Loka 
They have all mystic yogas, mystic powers, and they practice the eightfold mystic yoga means the traditional, traditional eight step process of Ashtanga yoga, really, at least we hear about it more in that context. That, of course, that's proper lists out the different, different particular processes. Yama, Niyama, Asana, Pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. Right. So they practice these things. And then they can become smaller than the smallest, heavier than the heaviest, etc. Actually, they can even manufacture a planet. Or get whatever they want and control whoever they want. So on Vidyadra Loka, it's common to see people flying. Like here. It's common to see birds fly. It's just, you know, nobody thinks more than a second if they see a bird flying by. So similarly in Siddha Loka, everyone's a great yogi. Perfect in mystical powers. Then there's a second paragraph here, and it just mentions Kapila is famous for expounding Sankhya. His father, Karadama, mystically made a great airplane, so he and his wife, Devahuti, could travel all over the universe, visit different planets. Right. So, okay, verse 20. Others also, the inhabitants of, of planets known as Kimpurushaloka, made the demon Maya into a calf, and they milked out mystic powers by which, they, by which one can disappear immediately from another's vision and appear again in a different form. So there's a purport here, Prabhupada says, that some people say the inhabitants of Kimpurusha Loka can do amazing mystic demonstrations. He says, in other words, they can exhibit as many wonderful things as one can imagine. The inhabitants of this planet can do whatever they like or whatever they imagine. So these are also mystic powers called Ishita. And the demons generally learn these by yoga. Um, and Prabhupada makes the point that in the 10th canto, Bhagavatam, there's a description of how certain demons appeared before Krishna in various wonderful forms, for example, Bakasura. Yeah. And while Krishna was present he, here, he had to fight with many of those demons who had powers from Kim Purusha Loka. Isn't that interesting? I don't think we knew that really. Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, although the inhabitants of Kimparusha Loka are naturally endowed with such powers, one can attain these powers on this planet by performing, by performing different yogic practices. Okay, verse 21. Then the Yakshas, Rakshasas, ghosts and witches who are habituated to eating flesh transformed Lord Shiva's incarnation Rudra Bhutanath into a calf and milked out beverages made of blood oh, Krishna, and put them in a pot made of Skulls. Oh my lord. Okay. Interesting. Ghosts are called Bhutas. Witches are called Pishachas. So in the purport, Srila Prabhupada makes the point. There are some, li some living entities who have human type forms, but their living conditions and eatables are abominable. 
Generally, they eat flesh and fermented blood. Oh, Krishna. Which is mentioned in this verse as Kshatajasavam. So the leaders of such degraded people are known as Yakshas, Rakshasas, Bhutas and Pishachas. They're all in the mode of ignorance. Tamagun. And they're all they're under the control of Rudra. Yeah. Who who is in charge of the of Tamagun of the mode of ignorance? Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, another name of Lord Shiva is Bhutanath, meaning master of ghosts. Rudra was born from between Brahma's eyes when Brahma was very angry at the four commands. Verse 22, thereafter cobras and snakes without hoods, large snakes, scorpions, and many other poisonous animals took poison out of the planet Earth as their milk and kept this poison in snake holes. They made a calf out of Takshaka, who is well, Takshaka is the snake or snake bird who killed Maharaj Parikshit, actually. So, okay, let's look at the purport here. In the material world, there are different types of reptiles and scorpions mentioned here. They are provided for by Lord Krishna. Yes, every species of life gets what they need by the grace of the Lord and what they need to survive because he provides for everyone on the planet. And according to one's position in the modes, one develops a type of character. Payapanam hmm. bujanganam If one feeds a serpent milk, the snake will simply increase his venom. Mm -hmm. But if one gives milk to a sage or a saint, they develop finer brain tissues to contemplate spiritual things. So Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, thus the Lord is supplying everyone food. But according to the living entity's association with the modes of material nature, the living entity develops his specific character. Okay, on we go to verses 23 and 24 are together. The four-legged animals like the cows <coughs> made a calf out of the bull who carries Lord Shiva, Nandi the bull, and made a milking pot out of the forest. Thus they got fresh green grasses to eat. How nice for them. That's nice. Ferocious animals like tigers transformed a lion into a calf, and thus they were able to get flesh for milk. The birds made a calf out of Garuda, and took milk from the planet Earth in the form of moving insects and non-moving plants and grasses. Wow, okay. So, okay, there's a short purport here. Prabhupada says, Many carnivorous birds descended from Garuda. Meat-eating birds like eagles. Yeah certain eagle or maybe all eagles. So one type likes eating monkeys. Eagles like eating goats, but many birds like to eat only berries and fruit. And Prabhupada says that therefore the words, the words, oh I see, the words churam, referring to moving animals and acharam, referring to grasses, fruits, and vegetables, are mentioned in this verse. Verse 25. 
the trees made a calf out of the banyan tree, and thus they derived milk in the form of many delicious juices. Well, that sounds interesting. Yeah. The mountains transformed the Himalayas into a calf, and they milked a variety of minerals into a pot made of the peaks of hills. Okay. Verse 26. The planet Earth supplied everyone his respective food. During the time of King Preto, the earth was fully under the control of the king. Thus all the inhabitants of the earth could get their food supply by creating various types of calves and putting their particular types of milk in various pots. And Prabhupada says in the purport here, this is evidence. The Lord is supplying food for everyone. Eku bahunam yovadadati karma. Even though he's one, Eko, he supplies everyone with everything through the earth. So, yeah, there, there are many types, there are many types of living entities on different planets. And they all get food from their planets in different forms. So Prabhupada says, on this basis, how can we assume no one lives on the moon? Uh, every, every moon is earthly composed of the five elements. Every planet produces different foods according to the needs of the residents. Srila Prabhupada concludes the purport by saying, according to the Vedic Shastras, it is not true that the moon does not produce food or that no living entity is living there. Well, surely that's what Shastra says. Verse 27. My dear Vidura, chief of the Kurus, in this way King Pritu and all the others who subsist on food created different types of calves and milked out their respective eatables. Thus they received their various foodstuffs, which were symbolized as milk. Okay, devotees, now the fourth and last section of this chapter, verse 28 to verse 32, which we've titled, The Earth Satisfies Prithu Maharaj and Receives His Mercy. Okay, so let's read through the verses first. Thereafter, King Pritu was very satisfied with the planet Earth, for she sufficiently supplied all food to various living entities. Thus he developed an affection for the planet Earth, just as if she were his own daughter. After this, the king of all kings, Maharaj Pritu, leveled all rough places on the surface of the globe, by breaking up the hills with the strength of his bow. By his grace, the surface of the, of the globe almost became flat. Verse 30. To all the citizens of the state, King Pritu was as good as a father. Thus he was visibly engaged in giving them proper sub subsistence and proper employment for subsistence. After leveling the surface of the globe, he earmarked different places for residential quarters inasmuch as they were desirable. Verse 31, in this way the king founded many types of villages, settlements and towns, and built forts, residences for cowherdsmen, stables for the animals, and places for the royal camps, mining places, agricultural towns, and mountain villages. 
verse 32. Before the reign of King Pritu, there was no planned arrangement for different cities, villages, pasturing grounds, etc. Everything was scattered and everyone constructed his residential quarters according to his own convenience. However, since King Pritu, plans were made for towns and villages. Okay, so let's go back through this. There's a couple of purports, not a lot. 28. Thereafter, King Pritu was very satisfied with the planet Earth, for she sufficiently supplied all food to various living entities. Thus he developed an affection for the planet Earth, just as if she were his own daughter. 29. After this, the king of all kings, Maharaj Pritu, leveled all rough places on the surface of the, of the globe by breaking up the hills with the strength of his bow. By his grace, the surface of the globe almost became flat. And yes, so there's a, a purport, uh, just a very short purport here. Um, I'll just read the purport. Generally, the mountainous and hilly portions of the earth are made flat by the striking of thunderbolts. Generally, this is the business of King Indra of the heavenly planets. But King Pritu, an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, did not wait for King Indra to break up the hills and mountains, but did so himself by using his strong bow. 30. To all the citizens of the state, King Pritu was as good as a father. Thus he was visibly engaged in giving them proper subsistence and proper employment for subsistence. After leveling the surface of the globe, he earmarked different places for residential quarters inasmuch as they were desirable. 31. In this way, the king founded many types of villages, settlements and towns, and built forts, residences for cowherdsmen, stables for the animals, and places for the royal camps, <coughs> mining places, agricultural towns, and mountain villages. Verse 32. Before the reign of King Pritu, there was no planned arrangement for different cities, villages, pasturing grounds, etc. Everything was scattered and everyone constructed his residential quarters according to his own convenience. However, since King Pritu, plans were made for towns and villages. Okay, so devotees, we have a short purport here. From the statement, we understand that town and city planning is not new. It, it, it has been done since the time of Prithu Maharaj. Like in India, you know, we see planning methods in the old city. Yeah, you know, the, the layouts of the roads, the walls, the city walls, the different residential areas. So Srimad Bhagavatam describes many such cities. Lord Krishna's capital, Dwaraka, was well planned. And similarly, other cities like Mathura and Hastinapur, now New Delhi, they were also well planned. Thus, the planning of cities and towns is not a modern innovation, but was existing in bygone ages. Hare Krishna. Okay, devotees, that's the end of the 18th chapter. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.